The protection of the ozone layer is the greatest news story, the greatest success that international environmental regulation has had. In this lecture, we're going to look at it, and this is part of our unfold, unfolding story of the major international environmental treaties since 1945. What we're going to cover, I'm going to start with some background to the ozone layer and ozone depleting substances, because this is one of those cases where it's, it's really important that you understand at least the basics of the science to understand what was the nature of the problem and then understand the response and how it's worked. We'll look at the response in terms of the Vienna, Vienna Convention for the Protection of the Ozone Layer in 1985, the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer in 1987, I'm also going to touch on the Brundtland Report uh, in 1987, that milestone of sustainable development just at the end of the lecture. But the focus is on ozone uh, protection and the good news story in relation to it. Okay, so let's just start with a little survey, a little questionnaire. Hands up uh, if you walked outside in the sun today. That's all of us. It's a little bit cloudy, but you were in the sunlight, so put your hand up and keep it up if you've been in the sunlight today. Okay, that's got to be everyone, everyone with their hands up, unless you slept in this building last night and haven't been outside, that's everyone. So keep your hand up, nice and tall, come on, don't be afraid, I'm not going to bite you. Okay, now with your hands nice and tall, keep your hands up if you thought about how international environmental regulation was protecting you when you walked in the sun? No one. Can anyone explain how it was protecting you? <laughs> it's a big guess with the topic we're looking at, isn't it? Yes. International environmental regulation, international environmental law and policy protects you every day of your life. Every time you walk in the sun, you are getting a benefit. Everyone you love, every place you love in the world is getting a benefit from international environmental law. So the ozone layer and the ozone depleting substances such as chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs is the uh, story behind that and it's an international success story. The context of this regime is, as we've already covered, the 1980s to the 1990s. Importantly, in that period, there was a, uh, it's really the peak of global concern for the environment, uh, spilling over from the earlier decades, but during that period, there were some major uh, discoveries and major disasters. We, we mentioned the sort of the disasters in the Rhine River uh, in the last lecture, but the discovery of the hole in the ozone layer was of incredible international concern. So if we step out and look down on our planet, this beautiful picture from NASA showing what's often called the blue marble, that picture taken in 1972 with the first picture with the sun behind the spacecraft so that there's no shadow on the globe. So if we come down to the level of the atmosphere, the ozone layer, I'm going to unpack it and show you some diagrams in a moment, but whenever you're looking at an image like this, this is a really famous image from about a, a decade ago. It's, you'll often see it used on websites. It was taken from the International Space Station and it shows the sun setting over the Western Pacific. So most of us from Australia and Asia are somewhere down beneath those clouds when this picture was taken. So you can see these big, this big um, storm system here, big cumulonimbus cloud rising up. Now all of the clouds that you can see are beneath the ozone layer. So whenever you see a picture of like this, of the, the planet with clouds, they're all beneath the ozone layer. They're beneath what's called the tropopause. So they're the visible clouds. And the ozone layer is just above them, you see that little blue sort of smear right on the horizon? 
that smear is basically where the ozone layer is. It's not actually, that's just a, the refraction of light at that particular layer. You, we can't actually see the ozone, but that's basically where the ozone layer is. It's just above the visible cloud layer. So yeah, if we come down and this quote from Carl Sagan, I just think is so apt. If you covered an orange with a coat of varnish, the thickness of that varnish on the orange would be in proportion to the thickness of the Earth's atmosphere to the Earth. So this, the, the, the atmosphere that sustains all life on our planet is so incredibly thin compared to the atmosphere. We know that if you basically went 10 kilometres into the atmosphere, you know, like if you climbed Mount Everest, and, um, which isn't 10 kilometres, but you know, nearly there, uh, so if you climb Mount Everest, you would be, most people need supplementary oxygen because it, the air is so thin, the oxygen is, is so low. So that's, you know, 10 kilometres is only the distance from here into Brisbane City. So if, you know, that's a, this really short distance that we do all the time in a car, and yet if you went vertically, that's, you know, you're, you're jumping out of the uh, livable atmosphere. So it's incredibly thin. The hole in the ozone layer uh, is commonly shown in images like this. So, uh, you know, a big purple splot over Antarctica. But that's uh, a computer generation. It's a, it's an, you, you can't actually see it like that. It's just basically a computer representation of lower ozone, layer, o lower ozone levels over Antarctica. Um, you can't actually see it. So I want to just play you a really uh, short documentary, and it's just a great one from Catalyst, an ABC um, program. I've edited it down a couple of minutes, but it's really, it's just such a great little documentary. Mid-70s to the mid-80s, 
Paul Fraser was recording a steady increase in levels of ozone depleting gases. And when the Shankton paper was published, a whole new field of chemistry opened up because no one had considered that the special conditions in Antarctica would generate this extremely powerful mechanism for ozone destruction. So what on earth was going on? During the winter, the Antarctic ozone layer gets cold enough that clouds actually form in the middle of the ozone layer and it's chemical reactions on the surface of those clouds that allow in the spring very efficient reactions to take place that destroy the ozone. There was a clear demonstration, an industrial release chemical, in, in minute amounts, relatively speaking, was having a massive effect on a, on a major atmospheric constituent. And it was unprecedented. Around the world, governments were galvanised into action. By 1987, we had a Montreal Protocol. By 1990, CFCs were on the path to never, you know, not being used anywhere. And by, 90, and by the late 90s, they were gone. And all we're left now is the residue of what we put into the atmosphere 30 years ago. The air I'm breathing here comes straight off a vast ocean, direct from Antarctica. Now there's just a handful of places in the world where the air is so clean that you can measure minute changes in the composition of the atmosphere. And this is one of them, the Cape Grim Monitoring Station in northwestern Tasmania. If something's detected in the air here, that's strong evidence it's everywhere. Since the 1970s, it's become the most important station in the southern hemisphere. The ozone layer, the outlook is good. Overall, there's been a, a significant net decline in, in what we call effective chlorine, and that's what drives ozone depletion. We are expecting to see an ozone recovery, but these CFCs are very persistent in the atmosphere. The atmosphere will remove them, but it takes hundreds of years. And so the, the long-term recovery of ozone is a slow process. We probably expect to see ozone recovery about 2060. On the left is the world we're living with. On the right is the world where CFCs weren't banned. Low ozone concentrations are in blue, average in green. If you let chlorofluorocarbons increase by 3% each year, starting in 1974, by the year 2065, virtually two-thirds of the ozone layer has been destroyed. That's not just over the poles, but everywhere. The Antarctic ozone hole becomes a permanent year-round fixture with a twin over the North Pole. In the 2050s, something very scary happens in the modelled world. Ozone levels over the tropics collapse to near zero. Levels of UV radiation triple. And UV radiation is used to sterilise things. If we never regulated CFCs, you wouldn't have been able to go outside for much time at all. Occasionally I think about what happened if things had gone wrong and we weren't able to carry the popular view and, you know, people just said, oh, you know, this is nonsense and um, we want to keep our CFCs, for example. I don't know. It'd be, um, it'd be certainly a serious health issue. So, wow, I just, every time I see that, I just find it really an amazing documentary and an amazing good news story of things that we don't think about now, really, because, you know, those, that problem has largely been fixed and the world did answer the call that the science put out to, you know, change course. It's an amazing uh, success story. As we'll see, there's some quirks in the tale where there's recently been some uh, major uh, releases of CFCs uh, from essentially illegal manufacturing in China uh, just in the last few years. So there, it's an ongoing um, story. It doesn't end. Just like said in previous lectures, you can't just set and forget these things and just think it's all okay now that you've, you know, you've done your policy regime and it's all going to be fixed. You, there's an ongoing need for work, for monitoring, for enforcement. Uh, yeah, it never ends. 
I just want to unpack some of the key concepts a bit. So we've run through them in, in the documentary, but I just want to talk about them a little more, a little bit more slowly. So if we think about our atmosphere, uh, there's multiple layers that are recognised. The troposphere is the bottom layer, the, about the bottom 10 or 11 kilometres. And then there's the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the thermosphere and the exosphere going out to beyond 300 kilometres. So if we just focus in on the bottom few layers, the troposphere is essentially where life occurs. That's where we live, that's where there's oxygen, that's where you know, we've got a pretty good temperature on the at surface level and, and life is really good. Uh, but it's very thin. Uh, above the what's called the tropopause, uh, we have the stratosphere and it's a very different uh, physical, uh, very different physically in nature. Uh, and then out from the stratosphere, the mesosphere. Uh, so, you know, when we look at our, you know, we're, we're used to seeing pictures like this, our, you know, of our amazing atmosphere, and, you know, we, we're used to seeing the clouds. So, as I said earlier, all of those clouds are down beneath the uh, tropopause. So, it's in the, it's in the bottom 11 kilometres of the atmosphere. Now, this image is a beautiful, just a still image from, there's a NASA... Um, time-lapse uh, image or film showing essentially the from the taken from the International Space Station and showing essentially the world rotating and on the horizon you see that golden sort of hue um, which is the um, uh, an aurora in the thermosphere or the exosphere usually about 90 to 150 kilometers above uh, the atmosphere, so we don't normally see that, like this is an unusual image um, capturing that. When you see pictures of uh, from space, typically most you see are the white clouds, and then if you look right on the horizon, there's that little blue haze, you know, it's just like this little blue haze, and that's uh, just above the tropo tropopause in the stratosphere, around about the altitude of the ozone layer. So yeah, I, I won't play this time-lapse image, but essentially you can click on it if you want, it's in the slides, and it just essentially shows the Earth rotating, and the, uh, there's this beautiful display of the aurora uh, in the, um, you know, way up in the atmosphere, but we don't normally see that, we, but we're very used to seeing an image of, from space now with clouds, and the key thing is that those clouds are all in the troposphere, um, but our atmosphere extends out um, hundreds of kilometres beyond that. So going back to this image, all of that um, activity uh, in the image is really all within that bottom 11 kilometres and then the blue haze on the, on the right on the horizon is around about where the, um, similarly an image like this, all the activities in the bottom 11 kilometres and then that blue haze that you can see just on the horizon is basically where the ozone layer is. So an image like that, I think, shows it really well, that blue. And yeah, all in the bottom 11 kilometres. OK, so let's just think about those layers a little bit more. Uh, so if you can see in this graph, it shows temperature and then altitude on the vertical axis. So um, notice this, let's start at the bottom. So the average temperature of the Earth is around about 14, 15 degrees. And um, as you increase in altitude, the temperature drops down to at about 11 kilometres. If, if we were 11 kilometres in the atmosphere now, it would be something like minus 40 degrees Celsius, so very cold. But then it doesn't just, you know, we might think it just keeps getting colder as you get out to space, but that's actually not the case. Above the tropopause, the temperature actually increases up to um, about minus, ne nearly back to zero at the stratopause. And then in the mesosphere, it drops right back down. Uh, so at 90 kilometres, it would be minus 100. But then again, it, there's a zigzag. Um, in the thermosphere, it actually goes right back up and gets really hot. So if you were at you know, 140 kilometres uh, in the atmosphere, it would be really hot, it would be above 60 degrees Celsius. So uh, I find that graph really interesting and intriguing. I, I certainly wasn't a, didn't study atmospheric science as an undergrad. So, you know, in thinking about that, it was like a revelation to me. I just thought it kept getting colder as you got out into space, but that's not actually the case. And 
I hope that brings home that you know there are these distinct layers and they have distinct physical properties and it's not just this sort of uniform um, thing going out getting less and less as you get out into space. Okay so importantly uh, in the ozone layer, so this is um, along the horizontal axis, you've got uh, levels of ozone in, they're called Dobson units, uh, and with altitude, um, sorry, altitude is on the vertical axis, and the ozone, uh, levels of ozone are shown essentially in that little sideways mountain. So what this is saying is levels of ozone at the surface are only just above zero. They're about five... Um, Dobson units uh, and then as you get up to the tropopause they've gotten up to about 15 Dobson units then in the tropopause they're above 30 Dobson units and then as you get out in the um, troposphere uh, they drop back down so it's this bottom layer of the stratosphere that is where the ozone layer is it's the, essentially the higher concentrations of ozone now ozone at surface level at the surface level so ozone is a molecules of three three oxygen so we know that when we breathe oxygen um, we're breathing um, uh, o2 so two uh, molecules of sorry two atoms of oxygen in a molecule that's what we commonly refer to as uh, as oxygen uh, and is essential for us and we're breathing it every time you breathe in right now you're bringing it you know you are breathing in uh, and taking oxygen out of um, the atmosphere and breathing out. So that's essential for life, but ozone, O3, is actually toxic to us, or it's a pollutant. So high levels of ozone, particularly from vehicle emissions in cities, are seen as a key pollutant. So at surface levels, it's a pollutant, but at 20 kilometers above the surface, it's actually a critical um, component of the atmosphere that protects life on Earth. And coming through uh, those, that graph, it shows um, different levels of UV light. And notice UVC here. It basically goes from what, what's coming from the sun. It's pretty well all absorbed at about 40 kilometres. By about 40 kilometres above the planet, it's all absorbed. And then UVB some of it makes it to the surface, and UVA, um, quite a bit of it makes it to the surface, but a substantial amount of UV light is basically absorbed as it passes through the atmosphere, and that is what the documentary was saying was critical uh, for protecting life on our planet, because if it wasn't there, essentially we'd be fried all the time, like you were, you know, like there's no way you would, you know, get in a big microwave and turn it on, you'd expect to kill yourself. Um, so similarly with UV light coming through, you know, it would be um, very, very uh, damaging to life. So um, just for a moment, um, just have a breathe in and breathe out. Now who can tell me what you just breathed in? In basically, you know, the major components. Nitrogen is, yep, one, but it's not. What's the biggest? Sorry? Nitrogen is about yeah, 80, 85%. And then oxygen is about 20%. And then what else is there? Argon. Yep, there's a whole heap of trace things. So nitrogen... Yeah, is about 85% of what you just breathed in. It's inert, and we don't essentially use it in our bodies. Uh, but the oxygen, as we know, is critical. So as you breathe in uh, across your lungs, your, your blood is exchanging, letting out um, carbon dioxide, or releasing carbon back out, and you're taking in oxygen, and then your blood transports the oxygen to your cells, where the oxygen is used uh, by your cells to break apart sugars, and that's what generates um, energy in your cells. And the waste, part of, waste product of breaking down those sugars is carbon, and it's transported in your blood to your lungs, and then you're releasing that carbon uh, as carbon dioxide when you breathe out. 
So you're getting rid of waste. So uh, nitrogen and oxygen are the two major components, but there's all these other things, including um, some um, uh, ozone at very, very low levels, but a range of other things as well. Water vapour isn't included in this. Obviously, water vapour changes depending on how dry the atmosphere is, so this is just the dry atmosphere. So ozone, in the ozone layer, in the atmosphere, what it's doing is it's broken apart by the UV light. So the O3 gets broken apart and the energy in breaking it apart is effectively absorbed. And um, it is a very fast reaction. So it's been broken apart, but the single molecule of, single, sorry, atom of oxygen is very unstable. And so we'll grab another oxygen and reform ozone very quickly. Um, but it's constantly then broken down and reforms and broken down and reforms and broken down and reform. And that constant cycle is basically how the energy is absorbed. It's the um, photolysis or the photolysis, depending on how you pronounce it, the breaking apart of the ozone by the UV light and then essentially it reforms. So it's yeah, happening at a very fast rate. And what, yeah, that's essentially the, the cycle, a schematic diagram of the life cycle of an ozone molecule being broken apart and reforming, being broken apart and reforming, being broken apart and reforming, just a never ending cycle. So what happens, um, sorry, um, ozone is typically measured in Dobson units, which is named after the scientist that did a lot of work on ozone. And so Dobson units essentially measure um, the amount of, the thickness of um, the ozone layer is basically measured um, in Dobson units, or the, yeah, the, um, yeah, it's, if you collapsed it all down, it would actually be really small, only a few millimetres um, high. So it's really low levels, you might think, but it's absolutely critical for life on Earth. So in the documentary, they mentioned some pa papers in science. So this is the just the abstract. The actual article is only a few pages long. I, I won't open it up. It's, it's, it's you know, heavy in chemistry, as you'd expect. But this paper in 1974 was, the, uh, was a major step forward. Uh, and the two um, authors ultimately won the Nobel Prize for their work. Uh, so um, the abstract reads, chlorofluoromethanes are being added to the environment in steadily increasing amounts. These compounds are chemically inert and may remain in the atmosphere for 40 to 150 years, and concentrations can be expected to reach 10 to 30 times present levels. Photo disassociation of chlorofluoromethanes in the stratosphere produces significant amounts of chlorine atoms and leads to the destruction of atmospheric ozone. So that was a major uh, scientific discovery. But the levels were thought to be so low that it wasn't, you know, there, there was a problem, but you didn't need to be alarmed. So, um, as I mentioned, the scientists that um, discovered that were, were recognised in the Nobel Prize. And this was a, an article written uh, on the death of one of those scientists, the death of legendary Nobel Prize winning chemist, um, Sherwood Rowland reminds us of the value of alarmism and the scientific duty to speak out in the face of impending disaster. Um, he saved the world from a major catastrophe, never wavering in his commitment to science, truth and humanity, and did so with integrity and grace. He's one of the true scientific heroes of our time. So what is happening uh, in that, basically that really complicated chemistry is the uh, chlorofluoromethanes, as they were referring to it, chlorofluorocarbons, what we now call ozone depleting substances. Essentially, any chemical that uh, breaks apart ozone and doesn't allow it to reform. So, uh, chlorine, um, nitrogen, um, uh, bromine as well, uh, is, are all um, uh, chemicals that can. Uh, stop that and act as uh, ozone depleting substances. So effectively what they do is they combine with um, the ozone or the, the, uh, the oxygen radical uh, to form other things and essentially stop the process, the, the, the rapid process of 
ozone being broken apart and reforming. So they break apart and they basically catalyze um, a breakdown in that process. So because they're catalysts, they don't actually get used up. They just keep coming back and back themselves. So even small amounts of them can lead to a major loss of ozone. Uh, and that's why they don't get, they stay in the atmosphere for a long time. So we've been out, science has recorded the drop in ozone globally. So this is an example of ozone above Switzerland since 1926. So you can see there until 1980, it, yeah, it went up and down, but there was no obvious trend. And after 1980, uh, there's been a clear trend of loss of ozone. And similarly, um, this image um, for the global total ozone time series since 1978, the trend is for a loss. So this is, uh, you know, the, the ozone regime that we uh, talk about was in the mid-1980s. So even since that, there's been an ongoing loss. That's what, in, in the documentary, one of the scientists referred to, you know, we're, we're left with the legacy of past emissions and that the recovery will be really slow. So the 1974 paper, uh, as you heard in the documentary, they, they just really doing pure science, the, the scientists in Antarctica uh, decided essentially to, to study what was the levels of ozone and they expected to find no real change. They, didn't, it, they weren't expecting to see what they found. Um, and when they reported it, it was a revelation. Uh, so large, again, in Nature, the world's leading scientific journal, large losses of total ozone in Antarctica reveal seasonal chlorine nitrous uh, oxide interaction. Um, so Shanklin um, is one of the men who spoke in that um, documentary. So recent attempts to consolidate assessments of the effect of human activities on stratospheric ozone using, using one dimensional models for 30 degrees north have suggested that changes of total ozone will remain small for at least the next decade. Results from such models are often accepted by default as global estimates. The inadequacy of this approach is here made evident uh, by observations that the spring values of total ozone in Antarctica have now fallen considerably. The circulation in the lower stratosphere is apparently unchanged and possible chemical causes must be considered. We suggest that the very low temperatures which prevail from midwinter until uh, several weeks after the spring equinox make the Antarctic stratosphere uniquely sensitive to the growth of inorganic chlorine, primarily by the effect of this growth on the um, nitrous oxide and, and, uh, ratio. This is uh, the height distribution of UV irradiation peculiar to the polar stratosphere could account for the ozone losses observed. So they not only observed that there was a change, but they postulated what was causing it. And uh, yeah, essentially their uh, results have been established to be correct. And essentially the story over um, the Antarctic is this, that it develops in August, it's fully developed by early uh, October, and it's broken up by early December. So it's, you know, breaking up now. We're in the end of November. It first began to appear in the early 1980s, um, and compared to the 1970s, there was a 60% reduction of ozone over the Antarctica in early October. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's associated with the cold Antarctic stratospheric temperatures where clouds can form, and that gives a surface whereby the um, catalytic reaction can occur really quickly. Um, so, yeah, this is just, you saw the, the, the changing images, these sorts of models, um, and essentially uh, the difference is huge over the Antarctica by the mid-90s. So, yeah, it's those clouds in the stratosphere over Antarctica that make it different to over the tropics. It's very cold, and it allows the reaction to occur much more uh, than it does over the tropics, um, but the effects are actually felt all over the world. This is a paper, I'm sure you can't read all of that, but essentially it's um, ozone losses cause increased UV light over the Antarctic region, but it also has, la has had large impacts on ecosystems in the southern hemisphere. This was a paper by a, a couple of years ago, and it was really, I found it really fascinating because they, uh, one of the hard things we face is that 
the global the ecosystem is operating at um, multiple dimension you know in multiple dimensions and in time scales that we find incredibly difficult to comprehend and there's all of these things that are interacting so that they're not just a single effect here that has you know doesn't affect other things in ways that are difficult to appreciate so the um, this is one of the images that they used that I found really interesting. So talking about the essentially the atmospheric circulation over Antarctica and the different cells and how um, that leads to effectively this sort of contained little environment over Antarctica in the atmosphere where, whereby the, there's extreme losses of ozone. But then it also talked about how that affects currents and they looked at it in sort of the... the um, four dimensions, so the three dimensions of space plus the dimension of time, and it's incredibly difficult to conceptualize that. But it's not just about ozone and just about, you know, there's many effects of, of this, the things that don't seem obvious. So in that context, let's have a look at the response. So this uh, paper was released in 1985 and there was an immediate reaction to it, like the world was alarmed. And by the end of 1985, the global community had signed, had written, so in terms of negotiations, this happened virtually overnight. They agreed that there needed to be a framework to address this, and they responded with the Vienna Convention for the Protection of the Ozone Layer in 1985. But as we've seen with other conventions, what that does is they established a framework. It was light on detail, uh, and it was followed up with a protocol. So it's a subsidiary agreement, the Montreal Protocol on Substances that Deplete the Ozone Layer in 1987. Still incredibly rapid, but you see that sort of two-step approach, a framework convention and then later agreements. And we'll see that when we look at climate change, uh, as you know, so there's the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, 1992, and then things like the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement are subsidiary agreements under the main convention. So, yeah, the Montreal Protocol has a great website, ozone.unep.org. Um, it's got 197 parties. It was the first treaty to ever achieve universal participation. Imagine that, the first treaty, or first, at least first environment treaty. Um, so it's actually beyond, if there's 193 parties to the UN Charter, there's even more parties to this than there are to the UN Charter. Okay, again, and I won't, I won't dwell on these, but if you were you know, working for government or involved in industry where you were looking at ozone depleting substances, let's just say you're an industrial chemist and you had to check whether a new chemical that you had invented had, had ozone you know, depleting potential, then um, you could go to the website and there are some um, handbooks that are you know, really long and really complex and you know deal with all the chemistry uh, and yeah it, well they're not just really long really complex they are also written in plain language and but there's also a lot of technical stuff there uh, so if you're looking at this regime it's not just the treaty it's not just the um, Montreal Protocol it's also the technical handbooks that you would need to be aware of and, but let's not get too bogged down in the technical details, but I just want to talk a little bit about the chemistry uh, because it's, yeah, it's, it's important to understand it, to then understand the regime and, and, and what it involves. So some of the common ozone depleting substances and the uses of these, so we've got chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs are the most famous one. Most people know about CFCs uh, and they were used for refrigerant gases, um, cleaning solvents, aerosol propellants, and blowing agents um, for plastic foam. And there's also halons, which were used for fire extinguishers uh, and explosion protection, um, carbon tetrachloride, production of CST, CFC feedstock and solvents, dilutants, fire extinguishers, methyl chloroform, um, used for an industrial solvent for cleaning inks and correction fluid, and methyl bromide, one of the really baddies, um, is being used as a fumigant to control air, um, soil-borne pests and diseases in crops prior to planting and in commodities such as stored grains. So these, they, they've been one of the hardest to replace because it was difficult to get a equally effective um, fumigant 
that could be used in agriculture. So the uh, methyl bromides have been particularly difficult. But it's not the key thing I want you to remember is it's not just fridges and it's not just aerosols that we're able to change and you know uh, use a different propellant um, for like a deodorant. It's actually a range of things. So if we just look at one of the reference um, chloro uh, CFCs that are used, this is. Um, trichlorofluoromethane or CFC11 so that's obviously just a representation we can't see the molecule but the molecule is comprised of a central carbon with th three chlorine atoms and then a fluorine uh, atom as well so CFC11 that's its chemistry so CFC11 is used as one of the key references um, so its production rate, it was used in refrigerant gases particularly. You can see here it was discovered in the 1940s, and then this is its production in thousands of metric tons, um, rising up to the 1970s and 1980s, and then basically it's phased out by 2000. So CFC11. And this is CFC11 measured in the atmosphere in parts per trillion. You can see it rising up there to levelling off in the 90s. And yeah, so CFCs in 1974 were used a lot in propellants, so in aerosol cans. So has anyone got an aerosol can in their bag? You might have a little um, deodorant. Has anyone got a deodorant or something in their, in their bag? Okay, well, if you did, like I'm sure you've got them at home. Uh, have, you, have you got one? If you've got one, pull it out and we'll read what's on the label. Um, if we could, Sorry, anyway, propellants. If, if you'd bought a deodorant in the 1970s, um, then it would have been virtually certain to have CFCs as what basically pushed the deodorant out of the, the can. And, you know, when you sprayed it on yourself, it was basically what was expanding and pushing the deodorant out and onto your skin. So propellants, um, refrigerants were another big use. So... Um, yeah, so this is like some, some cans. So like a spray can or a deodorant can in the 70s, they would have had CFCs in them. They were widely used for that. If you were to walk into any store now and um, buy a deodorant or a spray can, do you think, you know, like we had to check the label for um, palm oil? You know, we read through the label and it was hidden in vegetable oil. But do you actually, do we rely upon consumers to um, check that now? Do we, do we rely upon, you know, like for ozone protection, have we just left it up to product labelling? Just said, well, people can make up their own minds whether we think this is, you know, whether they want to use CFCs or not. No. We phase them all out. They're now illegal to use, like illegal around the world. Like you can't go into a store, you walk into any store in Brisbane and buy any can, it will not have a CFC as a propellant. You just complete ban on them, not able to buy them. We don't rely upon consumers to make that choice, <laughs> which <laughs> jumps out at you. Why, do we, why don't we do the same for something like palm oil or, you know, other, you know, like the labelling laws, is, it's just the lowest level of um, protection, you know, leaving it up to consumers. Um, we don't do that for CFCs. Completely gone, you can't buy them. Um, fridges as well. So I'm sure many people know how fridges work. Your standard like electrical fridge with a gas. What the, the electric, there's a little, essentially a little compressor and there's gas running. If you looked at the back of your um, fridge and the compressor basically compresses a gas, um, which the refrigerant gases were used heavily in the 60s and 70s were CFCs. And that gas is then pumped around uh, the back of the fridge and essentially allows to, and it, as it then um, expands, it draws out the heat from the fridge and it releases that heat behind your fridge. So, and then the compressor continues to pump the gas. So you don't release the gas from the fridge, like that's not the plan. So if a fridge remained, um, you know, operating and without any leaks, it wouldn't be a problem. But the problem is that ultimately, you know, products break down and if they get, you know, they get a leak or they get, they, when they're disposed of, uh, you know, they, 
someone breaks open the, the gas canister and it's released to the atmosphere, that's how they get out into the atmosphere. So those were the refrigerant gases. And the Vienna Convention um, for the Protection of the Ozone Layer, I'll just deal with a couple of articles. So it starts with the preamble saying we've got a big problem. Then it goes into some definitions. It's the same sort of structure we've seen for other treaties. So some definitions. The ozone layer means the layer of atmospheric ozone above the planetary boundary layer, so the troposphere or the tropopause. Adverse effects means changes in the physical environment or biota, including changes in climate, which have significant deleterious effects on human health or on the composition, resilience, and productivity of natural and managed ecosystems or on materials useful for hum hu um, humanity. Still using sexist language in 1980, mid-1980s. Um, Article 2, the general obligation. The parties shall take appropriate measures in accordance with the provisions of this convention and those protocols in force to which they are party to protect human health and the environment against adverse effects resulting in a likely to result in human activities which modify or are likely to modify the ozone layer. So that's a broad obligation. You know, take, um, yeah, take appropriate measures. It's like a qualitative, you know, nothing much there. Appropriate measures is very ambiguous. So the Convention itself, does, there's not a lot of detail there. The details come a couple of years later in the Montreal Protocol. And it is linked to the treaty, the main treaty. So just um, to point that out, the definitions in the protocol, for the purpose of this protocol, convention means the Vienna Convention for the Protection of the Ozone Layer adopted in 1985. Parties mean parties... Um, to the protocol, secretary means the secretary to the convention. Control substances means a substance in Annex A, B, C, or E to this protocol, etc. So then you get the articles. So we're seeing, like we saw with CITES and those other wildlife um, treaties, you see annexes used to put out, you know, to add in the detail. So you then get an obligation that's then there's a lot of things listed in annexes. So Article 2 sets out the obligation, and I'll, I'll just read it. I know it's long um, and, and legalistic, but let's just look at the language of it. Each party shall ensure that for the 12-month period commencing on the first day of the seventh month following the date of entry into force of this protocol, and in each 12-month period thereafter, its calculated level of consumption of the controlled substances in Group 1 of Annex A does not exceed its calculated level of consumption in 1986, by the end of the same period, each party producing one or more of these substances shall ensure that its calculated level of production does not exceed the calculated level of production 1986, etc. So that um, allows for some increases. So why, what's the reference to 1986 for? Why have that? So this has been agreed in 1987, isn't it? So what they're doing is setting up a baseline and it's allowing an obligation but to apply to all countries equally but in fact it differs depending on what your uh, consumption and production of ozone depleting substances was. The major producer was the US and there was a couple of major companies, the DuPont, that produced them. So. Um, in terms of production, it was mainly affecting U.S. industries, um, but there were other producers around the world. Um, but essentially, it gives us a baseline to work from. And then, if you look at Annex A, it lists things like uh, CFC 11 is listed first. And notice it's CFC 11 is used as a reference. It's got an ozone depleting potential of one. And then other uh, chemicals, other gases, get different... Um, ozone depleting potentials um, with reference to um, CFC 11. So for instance, Halon um, 1301 has an ozone depleting potential of 10, so 10 times the potential of CFC 11. So the list goes on a long way. I won't um, you know, go to it in a lot of detail. Um, here's Annex B, controlled substances. So again, um, different uh, chemicals and the substance and the ozone depleting and the ozone depleting potential. Now, to summarise all of this um, in terms of the phase out, so this table 
looks complicated, but essentially what it shows is that developing countries agreed to have a phase out quicker than developing countries. So for instance, chlorofluorocarbons, developed countries agreed to phase out by the end of 1995. So from 1987, they're gonna phase them out within eight years, and then developing countries had to phase them out by 2010, so they're given a much longer period. Um, obviously there's equitable reasons and practical reasons for why you would allow that, but also in terms of the practical reality, the developed countries like Europe and the US and Australia were producing and using a lot more of these things than say Kiribati or you know, um, Nigeria or uh, other countries that are in the developing countries um, uh, phase. So halons, similarly different dates and different um, for developing countries and uh, developed countries. The yeah, the a number of the the agricultural um, fumigants have been some of the most difficult to find replacements for. Also, fire systems. Uh, a lot of fire systems were, was very difficult to find chemicals to replace them that didn't have that you know that you don't obviously you don't want to replace them with something that's worse or something that you know has similar sort of effects. So you're looking for something that is basically inert. Uh, and also, um, yeah, so now I, I've emphasized many times, but international law to be effective has to be translated into national laws. Again, I'll just use Australia as an example, but uh, in Australia, uh, the Commonwealth or our federal government enacted the Ozone Protection and Synthetic Gas, Greenhouse Gas Management Act in 1989. So. You can see there the timeline, 1985 for the treaty, 1987 for the protocol, being implemented into national laws two years later. And I won't you know, dwell on that, but here's the result. So the effect of chlorine, um, if the protocol hadn't been agreed, they, effect, they expected that uh, effect of chlorine would continue to rise. But what's happened is the effect of chlorine has decreased so yeah, the, can, there's a whole heap of, um, you go and look at the ozone website for heap amount, you know, huge number of graphs, huge amount of um, evidence showing that there has been a decrease um, and you know, that this has avoided a catastrophe for the world. So this is a, pro you know how we talked about reactive and proactive in terms of the disaster driven and the you know, more proactive measures. This is in between, like it was reactive in the sense that the world was alarmed that there had been this effect, but it was also proactive in that we took immediate steps to avoid a, a disaster unfolding. And even though we've got to live with the legacy of the damage that was already done, we've avoided you know, a much worse future. So you could say on a whole, this was a proactive regime to avoid um, disaster. And yeah, <clears throat> so I just mentioned that there, there are ongoing effects. Uh, so in, 19, sorry, in 2011, we saw the first hole in the ozone la layer over the Arctic, so in the Northern Hemisphere, and that was because of a particularly cold winter which the Antarctic um, atmosphere is much, generally much colder, and so it's different to the Arctic. The first time we saw an ozone hole was in, two, in the Arctic was in 2011. And yeah, there's uh, ongoing updates about that, um, and you know, reporting back, and I, again, I wanna emphasize the importance of uh, evaluating how well we're doing, and then you know, thinking, can we do this more efficiently? There's the things we need to do to you know, be more effective, which is what you are doing in your research papers. So this assessment for decision makers in 2014 was one of the, ma like a major uh, review undertaken by the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program. And basically it was saying that we're seeing recovery, it looks like it's uh, effective, we're seeing uh, a, you know, we're seeing recovery, yeah, and we're not seeing as a rise. Okay, so that's good news. So this is a change from 1996 to 2012. The uh, effective chlorine and the, the tropospheric chlorine source gases, and you can see the different gases there. Notice CFC11, that 
gas I pointed out to you, a big component of it, CFC12. And then, you know, a lot of the other gases are relatively minute in their contribution that they make. Okay, so that was a good news story. And if we stopped at 2014, I could say, well, look, it's all good news. We're on the path to recovery. Uh, yeah, it was a good news story. So these are some um, headlines from when that report came out in 2014, a good news story um, on you know, good news. The ozone layer is showing signs of improvement. Scientists say the ozone layer is recovering. Fragile ozone layer shows first signs of recovery, US, UN says. That's 2014. And yeah, this was again another article, the Antarctic ozone hole has finally started to heal, scientists reported in science. But then last year, there was a, a shock. Uh, the news was reported that there had been a discovery of a mysterious rise in banned ozone destroying chemical chemicals. So it was essentially identified through the global monitoring network and scientists were, were shocked to actually see, hey, we were thinking that these things were going down, but they're continuing to monitor them. And like, you can imagine the, sh the global sh like shock that what's going on? They're coming back up. Wh where are they coming from? So this paper in, again in Nature, so emphasizing the significance of, you know, getting in, uh, published in Nature is incredibly difficult. You have to have something new and important and significant. So it's reported in Nature, a sharp and mysterious rise in emissions of a key ozone depleting chemical have been detected by scientists, despite its production being banned around the world. So what was happening? This is the, uh, just an extract from the paper, so in May of last year. And yeah, so this is some of the results. Uh, uh, global CFC 11, so that chemical I talked about before, um, was the reported production and implied release rate from um, CFC 11. And the reported, can you see there, I've just emphasized on that graph, is the reported production by 2005, 2006 had fallen to zero. But the observed production wasn't zero. So it was being reported as zero globally, but the actual production was significantly more. We're talking about production in gigatons per year. So that's a lot. It's not like a, you know, some chemistry student in the lab here at UQ has, you know, done a little experiment and it released, you know, 20 grams. This is giga, um, oh, gigagrams it is, so not gigatons. Um, anyway, giga, a billion. So the Nature Study prompted a UK-based uh, non-profit environmental investigation agency to probe the matter. And in July of that year, less than two months after the Nature Study was published, because they couldn't identify where it was from, they thought it might be somewhere in, in Asia, um, based on where it was being detected in the monitoring network. So um, these guys did some investigation, and less than two months later, it found that um, China's foam-making industry was illegally using CFC-11 uh, as a blowing agent, so here you've got someone, so in a, you know, insulation in buildings, um, you can see someone here blowing in the foam, looks like on the roof, to insulate them from, you know, the cold of winter. Uh, and since CFC is cheap compared to other alternatives, the industry uses it to manufacture the foam, which is widely used as an insulation material in buildings as well as refrigerators, freezers, coolers and heaters. And yeah, they, they did this report. I'm gonna play you a little bit. The, the, I, thought, I think the report's really interesting. I'm just gonna um, play it for you. I don't think I've got the... In 2018, scientists at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration discovered a mystery. Emissions of a dangerous and banned gas was increasing in the atmosphere and nobody knew why. A new report from the Environmental Investigation Agency has revealed answers to that mystery. 
，看一下他的馆长们。吓死了，你为什么要？不知道生产。我知道这个。就是这个呀、啊。CFC-11 is a synthetic gas that contributed to the hole in the ozone layer and is also a potent greenhouse gas. Because of its damaging effects, the international community agreed under the Montreal Protocol to completely ban its production. As of 2006, all countries have reported nearly zero new production or consumption of CFC-11. So it was mysterious when an academic study published in Nature in May 2018 found that since 2012, the amount of CFC-11 in the atmosphere has increased by 13,000 tons per year. In May, when the Nature study came out about there being 13,000 metric tons of CFC-11 in the atmosphere on an average every year, we were shocked. So the immediate question in our minds was, where is this coming from? Traders selling the gas on the internet told EIA sources that the overwhelming majority of CFC-11 is used in the foam sector. Before CFC-11 was banned, it was commonly used as the blowing agent in the production of insulation and other foams. EIA sources on the ground confirmed that multiple factories that produce the components for industrial insulating foam in China are using CFC-11 illegally in their process. We were shocked to find that of the 21 companies that responded, 18 companies spread across different provinces openly admitted to using CFC-11 in their Boeing agents. Our findings demonstrate that CFC-11 is being widely used in this sector in China. So the scale of this environmental crime is massive, both in terms of the ozone layer as well as our climate. But it is entirely thanks to the Montreal Protocol that we have an opportunity right now to ensure swift and strong enforcement. EIA's report recommends a thorough investigation into the entire foam sector in China. The illegal production and use of CFC-11 must no longer continue. So a fascinating report and really emphasizing the importance of ongoing monitoring and also enforcement and also the difficulty of enforcement because you, you saw as reported there the guerrilla tactics being used by industry to avoid so China had agreed to the Montreal Protocol, had, uh, you know, had made it illegal and industry was basically flouting those laws to do it because it was cheaper and they said the quality was better of, of CFC 11 and on a really large scale. So you think of the difficulty for the Chinese government in combating that. So, in, so it's not just, uh, you know, it's, uh, and anyway, China has had a strong, the Chinese government has made a strong response to it and commitment to essentially to uh, clamp down on the production of CFC 11. So, yeah, Montreal Protocol takes um, steps to crack down on, on it. So this was a news report from the 12th of November of last year. So the Montreal Protocol, they meet, you know, like a conference of the party each year. And at the meeting um, on the, in November last year, so there'd be one occurring around about now. Uh, and at the meeting, the 30th meeting of the conference of the parties, so the MOP 30, uh, to the Montreal Protocol closed in Ecuador on Friday with the decision on immediate next steps to understand and address CFC 11 emissions. We commend the sense of urgency and commitment expressed by the parties in taking immediate action to respond to the unexpected emissions of CFC 11, i.e. commend China. So uh, 
Montreal Protocol parties have now adopted a decision that requests information to be provided for the next meeting on CFC 11 levels, uh, potential sources of emissions of CFC, CFC 11, along with an analysis of current monitoring, reporting and verification under the protocol. The decision all, uh, also calls on parties to take measures to ensure the phase-out of CFC 11 is sustained in their countries and to share information relating to any illegal CFC 11 production or use. During the discussions, China shared information on a nationwide enforcement effort that has resulted in the discovery of two TFC 11 illegal production sites. Um, the person there saying China is to be commended for taking uh, immediate action to uncover and address illegal CFC production and use and the parties to the Montreal Protocol have demonstrated their united desire to address this environmental crisis but we still face huge challenges to fix this problem. This is a turning point, nothing less than a comprehensive overhaul of compliance and enforcement regime will ensure that this doesn't happen again. The unprecedented enforcement action reported by China and the unanimous support for tasking um, Montreal Protocol institutions to get to the bottom of this issue within months of the scientific alarm bells is an example of why the Montreal Protocol is often hailed as the most successful environmental treaty. However, it is critical to invest in syst systematic changes and aid continued, sorry, and aid continued compliance and also address the related issue of ref refrigerant banks, um, etc. So. Uh, yeah, a good news story, but also scary uh, in many ways. And you know the importance of ongoing uh, enforcement monitoring can't be understated. Okay, so you can go and have a look at that on the Ozone um, website. Um, yeah, a very useful website, huge amount of information there if you're interested in digging further into this topic. Okay, and then just a few months ago, uh, there was another uh, report um, of essentially the Chinese industrial areas identified as major source of illegal ozone depleting CFC gases. And you can see there is essentially changes in emissions, um, spatial distribution of the derived CFC 11 fluxes um, yeah, from 2008 to 2012, sorry, from 2008 effectively to 2017. So the red areas um, east and south of Beijing being the areas where the hotspots were. And that was um, again reported in Nature in May of this year. So ongoing science is critical to this whole regime. So some people claim you know, international law isn't effective. I just noticed that we've gone past um, an hour but there's only a few minutes to go in this lecture. So is it okay if we just go on and we'll take a 15 minute break? Okay. Okay, so some people claim that international law is ineffective. You'll, you'll often see that. You'll see people say, you know, international law, it can't be enforced, therefore it's, you know, they say it's basically useless. And I really want to bring home and really emphasize for you, okay, there are a whole heap of problems with international relations and international affairs and, and international environmental law. There are undoubtedly big problems and there are so many you know, issues like climate change where we're failing. It's really important to recognise the success stories and to recognise when governments are taking effective action and whenever you think about, you know, is it worth it or you know, are we having any effect, well think about ozone because we have changed the course of the planet, the course of humanity through this regime. And yes, there are areas like cl climate change where we're not being effective, but don't just wallow in the, the failures, recognise the successes, and also recognise governments that are trying to do the right thing. So the Chinese government, so I'm sure there'd be a lot of people, including Chinese students in this course, who would be very critical of the Chinese government and uh, complain about the things it doesn't do and the poor environmental quality uh, in many aspects in China. But we should also recognise um, successes. And even though you could say, well, they should have been doing that anyway, uh, I think the nature of the, that recording showed essentially it was a legal activity, sure, on a big scale. And no doubt there was corruption within some aspects of the environmental regulation within China. Uh, and no doubt there's ongoing, you know, China has, like many countries, there's ongoing problems with corruption. 
and those are just the reality that we have to deal with. But the Chinese government responded strongly to it, and you know announced you know it needed to take steps, and it recognises the importance of this regime. You know, it's not in dispute. So, the fact that something happens in a country, uh, yeah, we can. The response from the government um, in this case, I think, should be commended rather than just criticising it. Okay, so today when you walk in the sunshine, think about how international environmental regulation is protecting you and everyone you love, everyone you love, by protecting the ozone layer. So international regulation protects you every day of your life, whether you're aware of it or not. So most people, like virtually everyone walking around outside right now, None of them probably even think or are aware, they might be aware, vaguely aware of ozone depleting substances, but none of them, I'd expect, are you know, more, than, more than just a vague understanding of it. The actual implications of what this regime is doing for them, it's just impossible to understate how important this is. Okay, so that's the ozone regime. I just want to wrap up by talking about sustainability sustainable development in the Brundtland report, so just in this, this period and then in the next lecture we're going to move on to the 1990s. So context, and again I emphasise context and the history is so critical to understand why these things happened when they did. So the Brundtland report, Our Common Future, it occurs in this whole context of the global alarm about you know, pollution, uh, the hole in the ozone layer, the rapid action being taken. Uh, it was a report written by the World Commission on Environment and Develop. Um, the chair of it was Gro Herum Brundtland, a former Prime Minister of Norway. And the report is commonly called the Brundtland Report, and it's commonly credited with uh, bringing into international policy uh, the concept of sustainable development. And so sustainable development, this is the definition from the report, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of present generations without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. At a minimum, sustainable development must not endanger the natural systems that support life on Earth, the atmosphere, the waters, the soils and living resources. So if we think about ozone, clearly the use of ozone depleting substances did not represent sustainable development because it was endangering the life support systems of the earth. So you've got this threshold. It's not a question of often sustainable development now gets translated into the triple bottom line, which is this balance between environment, um, social and economics. So you often see the three circles and I'll show you that diagram. What I really want to emphasize is that secondary balancing exercise, the triple bottom line, is often mistakenly use in there's a there's a threshold question of are you protecting the life support systems of the earth and if the answer to that threshold question is no then you're not achieving sustainable development however much money you're making from it so if you're making a billion a trillion dollars out of ozone depleting substances and you could say oh well we're getting so much money from it now it's you know looking at the economics of it it's actually worth it now uh, if you're destroying the, the life supporting systems it's not sustainable development and similarly with the same applies to our use of coal and fossil fuels we are destroying the life support systems of the planet it's not sustainable development however much money we're making from it so as I mentioned you know you often see this these three circles and the idea that sustainable development is this um, balancing between environmental social and economic issues and just be wary of those diagrams because there's, an, there's a threshold uh, issue. If you're destroying the environment uh, such to the extent that you know, the life support systems of the planet um, are not going to be viable then, or you know, severely depleted, then it's not sustainable development how, however much money you're making out of it. And a, a good way to, to put that in perspective, instead of those three interlocking circles, is this one. It looks remarkably like a target, the bullseye diagram. Uh, and it was, and I love this quote from a US senator who died a few years ago, um, uh, Gaylord Nelson. And he said, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment, not the other way around. So economy is in the middle surrounded by society, surrounded by the environment. It doesn't, you know, the economy doesn't exist except through society and except through 
the environment. And I love this uh, cartoon. I've added the caption. I used to go past this, um, it was on a, a card by if, it, Gary Larson was a c cartoonist. Uh, he was very, very popular, particularly a couple of decades ago. Uh, he, yeah, you, I'm sure you've seen him. He had, he had the Far Side. I think it was the Far Side was his um, cartoon series. And I used to go past this card in uh, a newsagent, and I bought a copy of the card, and I just love it. And I've added the ecologically unsustainable development to it. So it wasn't in his original cartoon, but I love it because it also gets in a humorous way, sort of the glib sort of. Um, approach of a lot of our politicians about sustainable development. So if you imagine the guy with the bat is our Prime Minister, uh, oh, actually no, he's the catcher, um, our Prime Minister in Australia, Scott Morrison. He's the catcher and um, let's just go, say the guy with the bat is our idiot in energy minister, what's his name? Um, Angus Taylor. So they're playing catch and uh, so they're two goldfish. We're in, you can see what's happened, hey. Two goldfish, we're in a bowl, they're playing catch and one's just whacked it, and the ball's gone and broken the goldfish bowl, and water's pouring out. And I love that, you know, Gary Larson was so amazing and how much expression he could get just with a few circles and a dot. So, you know, you've got the little eyes and the mouth going, ooh. I would add an extra word to that, but I won't. Um, and so these two goldfish are thinking, we, this is a problem. Water's pouring out. What do we do? So ecologically unsustainable development, destroying the life support systems that we depend upon. So are we achieving sustainable development? And I just want to, yeah, unpack that a little bit. Can we achieve sustainable development in a culture focused on consumerism and economic growth? I think probably not. But um, if we're not achieving sustainable development, should we replace it with an overarching different policy objective? It's attractive to think, yes, but then uh, what would you replace it with? Uh, and I often think, you know, if you imagine, I'm sure no one here smokes, but imagine you're a, a heavy smoker and you've been smoking for years uh, despite the health warnings uh, and despite, you know, everything, you know, you, every time you buy a cigarette packet, it's got, you know, smoking kills, those green packets or whatever we've got here, uh, and you still smoke. And you go to your doctor and the doctor tells, tells you you've got lung cancer. And, uh, you know, is that a failure of the health warnings uh, or the science in terms of identifying that smoking causes cancer? Uh, you know, is that their failure? So should you replace the health warnings and the science? The same, I think, with sustainable development. It's like we were told in the 1980s that uh, coal killed and we continue to smoke it um, and you know we've got this um, prognosis of cancer now uh, and no one wants that prognosis but you know is it the is it the fault of the science is it the fault of the concept of sustainable development should we replace the concept of sustainable development because we didn't listen to it and we're not actually doing it um, I don't want to dwell though on the negatives. The good news is we are achieving sustainable development in some areas and ozone protection uh, and, you know, and that in that context we, human society, have demonstrated in the past an enormous potential to solve these major problems. So there are good news parts to it. Um, the bad news is overall we're clearly not achieving sustainable development and there's no simple or clear path about how we actually achieve it with ongoing population growth and modern cultural paradigms built around un unending economic growth and increasing consumption. It's no clear path to how we achieve it. Um, and there's also a widespread assumption that technology will solve all of, of our environmental um, problems, often called techno-optimism, the thought that, okay, yeah, we know there's a problem with coal, but you know, in a few years' time, no doubt some smart um, industry leader will invent some big vacuum cleaner that'll suck it all out and we're not going to have a problem, so we might as well party on because industry will solve it, you know, we'll work it out. Humanity will survive, we'll go on, it'll all be okay. So that techno-optimism, sure technology plays an important part in the future, but, you know, and I put up a picture of Star Trek here, so, you know, Star Trek, sure, most of us are fans of, you know, those sorts of 
sci science fiction movies. I know I've liked some of the movies. You know, the idea of humanity going out and exploring the far reaches of the universe. It's a great and very positive and hope that one day humanity does it. But all of that stuff was filmed in the studio right here on planet Earth and it's all make-believe. It's all science fiction. Emphasis on fiction. We can't do it right now. We can't get, you know, it's a massive achievement to go to the moon. Um, we're thinking about, you know, sending someone to Mars. The idea of going out and exploring the far reaches of the universe is, is just a fiction right now. There's no credible way that we can actually do it. So uh, technical optimism, you know, built around that sort of science fiction idea, you know, we've got to deal with the reality of the planet we've got. So, you know, technology has played an important, has an important role in managing problems. So, for example, developing alternatives to ozone depleting substances is, you know, and its many uses is being really important. And still, technology alone doesn't solve it. You've got a question? Yeah. Would you say that innovation like, quickly followed the regulation? Um, yes, is a simple answer. Innovation quickly followed. Uh, and essentially came up with other things. It was difficult for, you know, there was a whole, it was a very complicated problem for, particularly for the fumigant gases and the, a lot of the fire suppressant systems. It was really difficult and it has been difficult and you can see with the CFC 11 used in China that they were saying that the replacement GAT thing wasn't as effective. So, you know, it's not a simple black and white answer, but yes, technology was critical. Um, so, and legal restrictions on phasing out those things have been absolutely critical. So technology and the legal regime have been critical. I'm also curious how, how the industry responded at the time. So great question. How did, yeah, how did they respond? So DuPont um, tried to run a misinformation campaign, but essentially they were just swamped by the science and drowned out. And it didn't get the same momentum now that the fossil fuel sector has, where you know where they've, they've got this massive voice in Fox News in in the U.S. and the Murdoch Press in Australia and the U.K. that continues to you know de you know de delay and deny and. Okay, so we are achieving sustainable development in. Re we're, sorry, we're not achieving sustainable development in relation to climate change, I think because of two reasons. Um, one, because we haven't convinced a majority of people of the extremely serious nature of the threat if we follow a business as usual path in coming decades and continue to burn enormous amounts of fossil fuels. And that's why it's so important to talk about it right now in the face of the extreme bushfires in Australia, because it's bringing home to voters, emphasis on voters, that this is life-threatening. This isn't just something that, you know, a few colourful corals are being lost, oh, that's a shame, Tuvalu is going underwater, oh, well, that's, you know, sad, but there are only a few thousand people. This is something that is killing people here now, killing people we know and we love, killing us. And this is at one degree of warming. You know, the plan is to, to basically double the warming that we've got now, to go to two degrees. You know, we have got catastrophic effects now, and we are deciding to go higher and like actually even achieving stabilization at two degrees is going to be even even that's going to be extremely hard we could go be going way beyond that to three or four or six degrees warming like it's a different planet that we're planning to have and we're seeing catastrophic effects now so we still people still haven't got that this is a actual existential threat to our society and it's like a war, we should be on a war footing to deal with this. We shouldn't be saying, oh, it'll cost us, you know, $10 billion or $40 billion to replace our power system, you know, to shut down the coal sector. That shouldn't be the question now. It's like, you know, we're about to be invaded and, um, you know, that let's nationalise these systems, let's basically take them offline, let's go on a war footing to solve this problem because that's, what we, that's the scale that we need to act at. Yeah, and secondly, we haven't convinced the majority of people that there's also a positive alternative future without burning fossil fuels. So we need to give that positive alternative. It can't just be doom and gloom. There is a positive alternative, but it... Yeah, so both of those are critical. Okay, so there's no simple solution, and our, bar, our path forward, our hope and vision are important. I'm going to come back to that, particularly tomorrow, and talking about hope and, and you know, what you do. 
So yeah, we need to be pragmatic and engage with the reality of our culture and society. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, we need to feed our people, we need to keep them safe, you know. If, if a person is starving and they get, you know the choice is between eating a you know the last member of an endangered species or starving to death they're going to eat the last member of this, this endangered species so you know we need to give people jobs we need to keep them um, safe um, but you know we're not doing that if we ignore these threats so yeah to succeed you know the paradigm has to be linked with jobs and poverty alleviation and, and I'll come back to that again yeah Green New Deal in the US is a really positive, you know, pushing the, a rethinking of how we approach the economy and we can build it better. And there's a lot of jobs in this, you know, there's a lot of opportunities. I wrote this um, article a few years ago about environmental protection industry as a job creator. It was based on essentially China recognizing that one of the, the fifth pillar of their economy would be environmental protection. You know, if we think about environmental protection as a job creator, and jobs in it as you know real jobs and that it's a real service to us then you know it's not then a fight between the economy of jobs because you're actually seeing environmental protection as a job creator and we have to empower people this quote from um, Wengathi Mutimatha we need to empower them and make them aware that you know these resources are their own and they need to protect them yeah so I talked about this in lecture one this idea a paradigm of you know, we want all these goals and protecting the environment is the basis of that. So we need to, you know, make that the reality, bring that home to others. So, you know, I really hope that one day humanity does travel to the star, stars and, you know, colonises other planets. But right now, we've only got this place. And for the foreseeable future, there's nowhere else we get to go. You know, we're colonising them. What, you, you know, <laughs> it frustrates me, people like Elon Musk, you know, talking about colonizing Mars, when, you know, we've got this perfectly good planet right here. Uh, you know, let's look after the what we've got rather than thinking about going somewhere else and trying to re-establish what we've already got here. So, yeah, this uh, amazing planet. And this quote from the president of the Maldives from a few years ago, the last generations of humans went to the moon. This generation of humans needs to decide if it wants to stay alive on planet Earth. So, Wrapping up, we've looked at the ozone layer and ozone depleting substances, the Vienna Convention, the Montreal Protocol, really, really important regimes. For the purposes of our course, I just want you to be aware of it as a success story. The details of the science, not important for us, and you know, for the exam, just really, really though, want you to think of it as a success story. So in summary, the response to ozone depletion is an international success story and the most outstanding example of a successful international environmental regulation. The global community responded rapidly and largely proactively to scientific evidence to create a regime that appears to be effective in halting the loss of ozone layer. And sound scientific knowledge and understanding of the nature of any problem is the foundation to effective international regulation. And it can be really complicated. This is complex science, complex chemistry. But we got past that. You know, we relied upon the science and we did things to change. And also following the Brundtland Report, the concept of sustainable development emerged as an overarching goal of international environmental regulation. So in terms of further reading, if you're interested in ozone, go and have a look at the website. A lot of information there. You don't need to go any further though. For the purposes of our course, just remember this as a great success story. And every time you step outside in the sun, international environmental regulation is protecting you, whether you realise it or not.